Oi you, it's time for another episode of Dorothy and the Dealer. Let's tune into the conversation. Okay, so um, welcome to uh, Dorothy and the Dealer, Adrian. It's uh, First off, it's, it's very um, nice to meet you. It's great to uh, see you there. Um, you're obviously over the other side of the world, um, hence it might be a little bit crackly along the way here. But Adrian Hayes is basically, you're an author, you're an adventurer, um, you've had quite an extraordinary life. You're a, a mountaineer, climber, um, you've been a Sherpa, oh my God. A um, Sherpa? I, yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, not a Sherpa. I was sorry. Say, I have to take that back. Take that back. Gurkha, Gurkha. 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 <laughs> sorry. Well, look, let's face it, you might have been a bit of a Sherpa as well. <laughs> but um, you've 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 been um, a, a Gurkha. You've had a, a, a your latest book is uh, One Man One Climb, which One came Man's out Climb. One Man's Climb, which came out in two thousand eighteen. And um, welcome to uh, the podcast. How, how is it, first off? How is it over where you are? Uh, you're you're in England. Is it cold there at the moment? We're in about forty four degrees. I'm in. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, both, and uh, good morning to all your listeners. Um, yes, I'm in southern UK. I live in a forest, a national park. And uh, we've got no forest fires here, thankfully. Yes. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, it's a lovely, lovely place. I live. I live in a lovely natural national park with horses and donkeys and cows, sort of outside my gate most days. So it's a, a breath of fresh air in nature. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Well, we like to start our podcast off, um, Adrian, on a light-hearted note, and we'd love for you to tell us what. Um, what song you've been listening to lately, or what um, first song comes into mind as you're um, as you're sitting there? We like to start our podcast. Your go-to off with a song, song, perhaps. Oh, my go-to songs. I, I go to anything by Coldplay. They always sort of just get me into a different sort of zone. So, uh, oh. so my go-to song, my go-to song, probably Paradise by Coldplay. And that makes nice. me. And I, 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 used to sing. I still sing a bit and play guitar in a rock band. We used to, we used to play a lot of Coldplay songs. So I can do the falsettos of Chris Martin. Uh, pretty good, actually. Oh, I cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, we won't on, ask I won't you to sing it live on air. <laughs> <laughs> So perhaps um, we can start off, Adrian, by just telling um, for you to just tell some of our for to tell our listeners. I'm getting all tongue-tied. Um, tell our listeners just a little bit about yourself and, um, um, yeah, just a bit about yourself. Right. Well, look, right now you, you touch in, in certain things. I, I've got uh, many different hats, actually. I'm a venturing hat, an author hat, a speaker, a keynote speaker hat, leadership team and personal coaching hat. Uh, I do a few documentaries and I campaign, write and speak on sustainability, probably the most overused yet misunderstood word, word in the English language today. Um, how I've got to that position is a, is a, it's a long journey. Um, but look, I left school at six and I won't, I won't give you the whole life history, but I left school at 16, seven years, university of life, uh, adventuring around the world, including working on a farm in New Zealand for six months yeah. and uh, climbing mountains there. Yep. Joined special forces two years, commissioned uh, as an army officer to the Gurkhas. So I was a British officer in the Gurkhas for eight or nine years. Wow. Then went back to get an education, got an MBA in university for a year. Then went into business so selling Airbuses in the Middle East and Asia and got into the whole development world at the same time got into the whole MBA. So that, so the corporate world uh, and the development world and the adventure world was continuing on. So that sort of journey sort of led me into doing what I now do uh, full time really for the last 15 years. Right. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm interested to see... You know, we we our, our voids tend to give way to our values. You know, the things that we perceive are missing in our childhood. You know, derives the value systems which and the things which we hold in high esteem in our lives. And I know that you were you were raised um, kind of in the country. Your parents were hoteliers, and and you had the free reign of of the land. Is is this really where it came from? What you know, this desire to climb and and this sense of adventure is is this where it was bred into you? Yeah, look, and, and you touch on a, on a good point. You know, all our values, you know, who we become in life is, is very much determined by our childhood, you know, mm -hmm. where we live, our environment we live in, our parenting, our schooling, our friendships, you know, order of birth, 
gender, all these things make up who we are. Who we are. And, you know, let's be honest, uh, parents ran a hotel, which means they were really 24-7. So we were pretty much left to our devices. I got the source. I was quite, uh, you know, I was a middle child and I struggled through a lot of things. I wouldn't say I was a happy child, but I struggled a lot of things. And my, my great escape was dreams of the polar world and, and big mountains. And I had pictures of a Japanese polar explorer on my wall, aged about 12, and, uh, mm. and all these things. And these were the sort of dreams that, that uh, inspired me. Coupled with that's how we were living our life. And I'm not unique on, on you know, anyone over a certain age who, as a child, we were out doing climbing trees, rafting down rivers, building dens, exploring. I mean, that was the life we, we lived, lucky enough, in a beautiful nas- national park called the New Forest. Right. And then, uh, y- you know, uh, throughout our, our journey, it seems that there's times when we come across someone that really influences, you know, we, we meet the sage at some point in time within our lives, that, that one key person that influences and, and sets our foot on the right path. And who, who do you believe or feel that was for you? I think I'd rather think that as opposed to one person, there's been many people. And I, and I can look at anyone in the world or anyone I know and say, look, there's an attribute about this person that's quite admirable. There's an, you know, things like this. But I, I think probably the first person who kick-started this development world, the world of development, was, was the, the well-known speaker, Robin Sharma. Um, he's Canadian, Robin Sharma. And he wrote the book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Mm-hmm. And I sort of got into this in the mid-90s and thought, wow, this, this is a way of life that I, I hadn't really touched. I touched it on my MBA program, which I was doing at, at the time. And then this, and then I saw Sharma speak it was in, uh, you know, at, at a public seminar. And it sort of started this whole new life. And this sort of put in a whole load of the things, which I know you're going to be talking about over the next hour, but all the whole, the, the, the concepts, the tools, the whole things on this personal growth journey that we're all on. Because up to then, you know, schooling didn't do it. I, I went to a pretty, pretty bad school. It's strong on discipline, but it wasn't good on education. My parents were too busy uh, running a hotel. I was on my own for seven years adventuring around the world. And then the army, of course, you know, great development for me. I mean, born in discipline because I'm kind of a freedom loving rebel. I'm a free spirit. The army brought me discipline. But of course, it's a very much do as I say, say as I do hierarchical structure. Mm-hmm. Back then in the, in the 90s, uh, you know, you know, you didn't, you didn't talk about personal issues. So, you know, man up, it's, you know, stand up straight and all the rest of it. it was that sort of military force. Of course, it's all changed now with PTSDs and mental health, how this has come to the, to the fore. So, you know, uh, so I thought, as I said, to put that into perspective, struggle through the childhood, the teens, the adventure, and in the army at certain stages, but it was getting into the world of personal development. Sharma sort of kick-started the process. Right. And then, uh, you know, I mean, as a, as a Gurkha, and I mean, how did you end up as, as a Gurkha? I mean, uh, first thing, I, I always thought that, you know, the Gurkhas were selected. The British Army would make their way through um, Nepal and they'd go to certain villages and they'd handpick these young kids. And, you know, these kids wanted to become a Gurkha. That was their vision in life. And if they were knocked back, you know, it would destroy them. And so, I, you know, I, I've spent a small bit of time in Nepal. As I, we said earlier, we, we, we climbed um, Mira Peak. We made it to about 5'9", and then we had to turn back. Um, uh, but I remember, you know, seeing some of the Gurkha army there and they were, you know, they were a, a very imposing force. And, and you know, my w- one of my brothers always said to me, you know, when, whenever the Gurkhas are in town, <laughs> everybody leaves because they know that these guys are some of the toughest guys on, on the planet. As, you know, as a Westerner training with the Gurkhas, did, did, it, did you find it, you know, it, it, it brought out another part of you that you didn't think you had? Did it? Did, to be able to compete with, with these guys? Well, uh, I think I'll answer that two, two, two separate sides. First, you speak about the Gurkhas. And for those listening who, who aren't aware, look, the Gurkhas are certain tribes in Nepal. Yeah. Uh, they are slightly lower down from the Sherpas. Everyone knows the Sherpas, the high altitude ones. The, Gur- the Gurkhas, right. slightly lower altitudes, but still hill boys and girls who grew up in the sticks farming. They walked to school, you know, five miles a day and back, and they are tough soldiers. And as you rightly say, 
for every one that gets into the British Army, 300 uh, attempt it. So it's a huge, wow. huge prestige and huge competition to get in. And some of these guys in my day would, would walk 400 miles to get to a recruitment selection to do it. Wow. It's gone a little bit more upmarket now. So that's, the, the, that's who they are. Um, I'm obviously not a Gurkha. I'm not from Nepal. Uh, by the way, all, Nep- all Gurkhas are Nepalese, but not all Nepalese are Gurkhas. So oh, Gurkhas okay, are select okay. tribes. Yeah. But, um, but as a British officer, you basically go to Sandhurst, Royal Military Academy, and you can apply to the Parachute Regiment or the 42nd Bengali Foot and Mouth Light Infantry or whatever you right. want, the engineers, whatever. Um, and I really want to choose the, Gur- the Gurkhas because so, it led me out to, the, to uh, Asia Pacific, and I spent most of my service out there, including a few tours down in Australia. Wow. Um, so, um, so, so that's the first part of the question. Now, how it developed me, well, I think I'd already got that discipline. So, so I've been mountaineering since I was 16, 17. So I got very physical fit on the side of things. But then doing special forces selection and spending two years in one of the SAS regiments, I suppose that really, you know, got me toughened up to, to the highest level I've been. So I think um, training with Sanders and training with Gurkhas physically, I, I was, you know, uh, right on 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 court but even having said that they are tough hombres they're, they're yeah. tough uh, tough old soldiers and yeah. and i think it, look if you could keep up with them physically you gain that respect so hey sahab hey sahab as i was called you know is always <laughs> i was quite renowned as being quite a uh, a, a fit soldier even if i'm under the you know peacetime army perhaps i wasn't i didn't probably excel in admin and and sort of all that side of things but i did on the physical side yeah, yeah. Um, did you, ha, ha, with what you've learned, how do you now work that into your business with your clients in, in terms of leadership? I know we touched on value systems. We're big on value systems ourselves here and making sure people are doing what inspires them and what, what they love. You know, the study of axiology is, uh, I think, is, is revolutionizing psychology at the moment and how we see human potential. But how has, you know, I mean, it's obviously done it in many, many ways, but how do you translate that into a system where you can help your people and your clients? Well, I, I like to think that I bring in all aspects of, of my life um, into this, into my work now, which, as I said, is, is either keynote speaking, you know, 45 minutes an hour, but primarily the longer development programs, whether it's morning, whether it's one day, two days, or six-month programs. And I like to think, you know, bringing in the military experience, because there is a lot of experience from mm-hmm. both special forces and serving the Gurkhas. My corporate experience, you know, I've, I've worked in some senior positions in corporate, like uh, including selling Airbuses. It's not quite door-to-door yeah. sales, uh, yeah. but selling aircraft there. Yeah. Um, the expedition experience, which I expect you'll, you'll ask me to put in a minute, mm-hmm. the, the long experience. And above all, I'd say above all, it's the whole learning, development uh, the, the world of personal development. What I try and do is, is it's not unique for anyone who's done some big adventures or been in the military or, or, or certain levels in corporations even to tell people, you know, what they did in the military, what they did in expeditions with, and, and all those things. What I try and do is a bit of both. Yes, I bring those lessons in, but I also bring the concepts, the models, the tools, the techniques that I learned in this 20 years of study, in fact, it's probably more 25 years, uh, 20, yeah, 24, 25 years of personal event, bringing all these things in, which had I known these things when I was in the army, I would have actually put, you know, changed a lot of way we do things. But of course, I've, I've grown with these things over the years. So it's a bit of push and pull, a bit of everything. Experience learned in all these extreme places, army, military, corporate, uh, expeditions um, or, or and all the, the world personal development leadership development team development bit of both mm. so how about how about um, uh, before we dive a little bit deeper can you talk to us a little bit about your expedition experiences and summarise that for our listeners well yeah why not summarize? I've been doing it since <laughs> I was 16 um, and, and I like to say look I don't come across and trying to claim I'm Britain's greatest alpinist mm-hmm. um I'm an all-rounder, you know, mountains, polar, oceans, jungles, deserts, kayaking, Ironman, adventure racing, the lot. And, and secondly, the, you know, the adventure side is only one part of my life. If you, the, the ones who really star in adventures nowadays, I'm thinking of someone like Alex Honnold, 
free solo climb the Al Capitan. Yeah, yeah, that's what they are. They are a rock climber. And that's mm-hmm. what they do. Yeah. I've been an all round all my life. Um, but but I think you know the Himalayas. Look, I speak Nepalese um, fluently from from a time the Gurkhas. I know Nepal from Gurkhas from uh, from there. So I think it's it's really you know the the big projects of climbing Everest I did in two hundred six. Um, Trek to both poles, North Pole, mm-hmm. South Pole, trek across the Raymond Desert, climbed another few eight thousand meter peaks in in um in Nepal. Uh, the <laughs> that sounds like you're brushing the- that off like it's a nothing. Climbed what? another few. <laughs> we just did one and we were like dying. I mean, <laughs> and what, we didn't even go I, that far. We didn't I even summit. <laughs> we pre- we prepared like about a year beforehand. So we we brought in and bought in uh, New Zealand white jackets like f- that the New Zealand rugby players wear. So they, you, we were strapping 20 kilos to ourselves plus backpacks pl- filled with water trying to get to as many... Doing m- three hours at least a day. Three of, hours at least. Uh, nothing, nothing. Great training. We, oh, nothing we did here could have prepared us for what we were in for. You died. What, what I found <laughs> was up there, I mean, I, I, we, you, you got AMS at about 4,800. Yeah. Um, in I, hindsight, I probably shouldn't have gone. My gone iron was high, very yeah. low. Yeah, so yeah. I was I, seeing LCD screens in the side of the mountains. So they decided that it <laughs> probably, probably wasn't a good early. idea for me to keep climbing. But uh, nothing we could have prepared us. But I think that the biggest thing for me personally, Adrian, was the mental game. Because once we got above a certain altitude, I couldn't hear anything other than my breath and other than how I speak to myself. And it, I was like, wow. How we how we speak to ourselves, you know, and, and 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 that internal voice, which is obviously trying to, obviously trying to protect me in some way and get me out of danger, because I knew I was walking further and further up into danger, and my body was, you know, there were certain things. Oxygen was low, and at one point we were covered. We covered like four hundred meters in nine hours uh, on a, on a glacier, and you know, it was it was pretty scary. It was pretty frightening. Um, I mean, how, how do you handle those things when you're up there? How, how do you handle that? Well, um, I'm going to go back to what you said a few minutes ago, but you said you make your, I brush, you, you said I, you tend to brush it off. <laughs> I actually get a little bit, um, I get a little bit, I don't know if embarrassed about, you know, when people tell me what you've done, yep. um, I get a little bit sort of, uh, Embarrassed because because you know I'm going to come onto this I'm sure because we're in this world of everyone bragging mm. rights about claiming they're the best and the fastest and the strongest and best. So I actually get a little bit sort of a yeah. I don't know just don't like to go that way. So so that's the first thing. Look I, I, when it comes to these big things and and this is where I would say military training does prepare you because you've gone through the real mill and you put up with pain pain for many, many hours and days on selection courses or hacking through a jungle with very little water, very little food, or freezing your butt off on on some godforsaken plane in, in the middle of northern Europe. You know, this this gets you through it. It's obviously a yeah. great discipline. When you're on a massive expedition, I'm gonna give you two which uh which really did drive us we, with the vertical crossing of Greenland, which which was about three about three and a half thousand kilometers to two and a half thousand miles, and that took us sixty seven days. You know, it, it's it's far too long to to think about the end. You you cannot think that far mm-hmm. ahead because so much can happen. You've got to break it down into these interim goals. You've got to break it down on a mountain. Now going back to the second example. You know, it's not about getting to the top. It's about getting to base camp to start with. It's good about setting up camp one um, and, and safely getting back down. When I say setting up, you know, getting tent equipment stores, setting up camp two, things like this. Um, you know, the, the, the greatest challenge I did in mountaineering was K2, the world's second yeah. highest mountain. And mm-hmm. where there you are forever in always in real danger losing your life. So there's a mm-hmm. very, you know, cautious thing. But what I would say... You know, no mountain is worth losing its life on. Yes, you've set a goal. Yes, you want to achieve it, but you've got to be realistic about it and keep your awareness muscles, your observation muscles. You know, these things are on are, are on fire on these big expeditions because mm-hmm. you're away from the clutter of social media and in information overload. You are really, really on a different frequency. Yeah. But I think, but what keeps you going to go to go to your your question? What keeps you going is is the goal you've set. The goal you've set, you might have been spending three years over that goal. 
and and there's an authenticity needed about that goal. Mm. And can I can I elaborate on that? Please sure. do. Yes, this is where we wanted to dive into yeah, anyway. So let's go. It. Yeah. Look, let's again. I think there's a huge lack of authenticity in the world today. Um, I did not trek all the way to the South Pole over two months to raise awareness of climate change. <laughs> I did not climb Everest to show that women, diabetics, prostate sufferers, cancer sufferers, that you too could achieve your dreams and fulfill your potential. And I did not climb K2 to raise awareness for, or money for Pakistan's poor, cancer, or any other causes. These are great causes, don't get me wrong. And I do all this in my other parts of the world. I'm, I'm passionate about sustainability. I'm a patron of two charities. I do my little bit for the world. And I'm passionate about people. I do these programs for people. I'm passionate about people. But I do these big expeditions for myself. And in all honesty, so do most other people. Yeah. Regardless of what they say. Whatever. You don't climb a big mountain like K2 because you're doing it to to raise money for cancer. No, you don't. You're doing it because you want to do it for yourself, okay? Mm. Okay. and look, I, I get people, so some people may say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's a bit controversial. I get it if you're climbing Everest, which costs about 50,000 US dollars, what's that, about 100,000 Aussie. You know, I get it if you're, if you're spending three years preparing, two months on the expedition, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 doing it, and you raise a million, good for you, fantastic. You've done yeah. great. Yeah. Most Everest expeditions nowadays are raising about five thousand Aussie dollars, something yeah. like that. That's what it is. Wow. So my 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 challenge to listen: if you are really passionate about those orphanages in Kenya or that uh, that uh, cause that cancer, why don't you go and work direct and put all that money to those orphanages or work in a cancer hospital or something like that? Yeah. Do it direct. Yeah. Um, so your so, point there is the, uh, that you have to be real about what the actual purpose of you actually doing the thing that you're saying. Is that correct? The authenticity yes, of what, you, why you want to do the thing you're saying you want to do. Absolutely. Be, be authentic about why you're doing it because an inauthenticity, when the going gets tough, and you, may, you know, some listeners may think, well, if I'm, I'm doing this for charity and other things, but it really... It, it doesn't really drive you in the darkest moments. You know, you're, you're gonna, you're, you suffer on these things. Let's be honest, you suffer. Yep. Yep. And, and you, you've got to be very, as I said, very clear why you're doing it. But it's the time, it's, it's your, it's the time you put into it. Maybe sponsors. It's the loyalty to your teammates. It's the whole thing you've, the, 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 the Commitment you've said to yourself about doing these things, um, yeah. and these are things that perhaps drive drive you on. Plus, you know, on a, on a more mundane, um, mundane level, having a sense of humour, you know, mm. like trying to go to the toilet at minus sixty degrees <laughs> Celsius on a north <laughs> side position. It's absolute. It, it's so bad. It's yeah. so. It's so absurd. You just have to try and laugh at it, even though it's not very funny at the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, uh, I think there's a couple of important points there because I do agree with you. You know, if you're going to give the, if you're going to give the charity, do it anonymously, do it because you genuinely want, you're not using, you know, pictures of, of babies or orphans on your fridge to let everybody know that you're supporting. Just do it because you're just doing it. And, um, and then if you are going to do, you know, so, like I, I remember when we were going in to do this climb, it was like, you know, because when I was on the way up there, I was like, "What the fuck am I doing?" This <laughs> his why? wife, his wife was in Bali at the time, yeah. and I remember going, yeah, oh, I just, uh, why, "Why are we I not di- there? <laughs> why, why am I not in Bali? Why am I doing this?" But I, I think part of it was because it was a sense of community with people that I was with that I loved, and and with that sense of camaraderie and, and pulling sense together, that well. sense of achievement and connecting with them on the way up. And, you know, in those raw states, you have to have each other's backs. You know, you, you, I, I watch grown mm. men walk into camps and collapse on the ground in their 50s and burst into tears and, like, look at you as if to go, oh, my God, I can't go on. And then you're picking them up and sitting them next to you and zipping up their jacket and putting their hood back on, giving them water and saying, we can do this. Come on, let's just, we, we just, let's just rest. It's okay. I, I think that was really one of the 
the great things that I got out of that, you know, is the human spirit. And when we take everything away from us, we really do get to connect on quite a beautiful spiritual level, you know? And yeah, I, I think that was one of the yeah. reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Look, do you want me to comment on that? I Please. mean, again, there's two parts. I'm going to go back to your earlier comment. Um, why are we doing these things? Social media, look, I, I have been doing these things since I was 16 years of age. Yep. And it was a commitment to me. I wrote, I wrote down these, my, my plans when I was 12, and it was right. a striving to achieve everything I could in life and achieve big goals. It was personal goals. It was self-worth. It was self-respect. It was all these internal things. But it comes down to significance. You know, we're doing it, doing it for myself. Where, where social, which I touched on it, where social media is is really distorting the world. And I'm talking about everything, not yep. just dimensions. It's we're on public display and everything we're showing is on is is in public. So we're getting this distracted that this subconsciously or consciously we're putting it out there on pub, on social media to show our worthiness. Mm. Or in layman's terms mm. to basically look where I am, mm. look what I'm achieving, mm. look at me. Now Again, people listening may, may sort of bulk at that, but, but it's an absolute fact. And it's, yeah. it's subconsciously or conscious we're being forced to put it on there. You mentioned it, the charity. If you really are integral about that, that charity work, then do it anonymously. So yeah. much charity world now is basically, it's become more about the person that's right. than the cause. It's, mm. it's particularly with celebrities. Mm. So that's the first thing. Um, the, the second point, uh, and, and by the way, just uh, look, even I've been distracted. You know, mm. K two, I, I was getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of well wishes and things, and, and I was thinking, what is this about? I'm doing this for myself, or doing this for, for all this recognition? So, even, so I've really done deep work on it. Mm. Um, on the second thing, the, the camaraderie. Yes, you can have. I think any intense experience, whether it's um, army or expedition or some course. You know, even some of these personal development courses I've done, which have been really emotionally intense, you you create a bond that perhaps we don't get in the normal day to day lives nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, and those bonds can last forever. So mm -hmm. you're dead right. I mean, my my buddy I climbed K two with Al Hancock. We speak every month, Canadian mm -hmm. guy. Um, and I'll trust him. I'm I'm putting my fingers together. I'll trust him with my life for my life. Mm -hmm. That's how close we were mm. and we're totally different personalities by the way and it's not about personality but we had that trust between us um some of my greatest friends perhaps I, or some of my great friends i wouldn't trust them so much some people are not as close friends i will trust in my life that's a very different thing yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, well there's a i've got a heap of notes here from your book adrian and i like um you know, you've you've mentioned about um, significance and there's a desire for significance. And I've got a note here that says, you know, the adventure world is a desire for significance and that one of our human needs is to feel significant and that you are concerned that social media is giving people that feeling of significance as opposed to them. Uh, well, can, can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Like what you, what yeah. you feel with that? Yeah. Uh, Significant the basic human need. We all need to feel it. it's part of our you know life on earth. But but before social media, we got it through jobs, through promotion, through marriages, children, whatever. We got it there. Social media has gone. Everything's now public, and so I, I think it's, we've gone from internal, again internal significance, uh. pushing through goals, striving to be the best you could be, striving for excellence, whatever, to external recognition, respect, attention, sympathy, and fame, and it's it's on there. And it is distorting everything we, we do. Even birthdays. I'm going to say something. Birthdays <laughs> on social media. What yeah. is that about? Yeah. What are we? Yeah. Why do we have it there? Yeah. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah. Now you may say it's harmless. Okay. But the charity, well, the JustGiving.com, the the holiday snaps, the selfies, the yeah. the whole everything we're doing is on there. Now you may ask some people may listen now. Well, okay, it, it's all a bit public PR show. Yeah. But it doesn't do us any harm. Sorry, but it is because this is the other downside that everyone is seeing this other world out there showing how much they've done, how much they've achieved, how wonderful. I wish happy anniversary to my darling husband, who's not on social media, by the way, but we have to post it. Mm. Thank you for 20 years. And you are the most wonderful husband I could ever. What's that about? 
Yeah. When he's yeah. not even on social media, he's sat, yeah. he sat right next to you on the table. Yeah. You know, you're putting out there for attention. Yeah. Or yeah. you're doing yeah. for sympathy. Yeah. Um, mm. Now, the, the downside of this is particularly with younger people, we're seeing this world, this unreal world out there, mm. and people are feeling they are not worthy. Yeah. They are not worthy because they have got nothing to show. They're not climbing Absolutely. mountains. They're not doing things for charity. They haven't got 10 A-star A-levels. Yeah. No, and, and at the extreme ends, this is where teenage depression mm. and teenage suicide rates are soaring. There's yep. never been so much mental problems in teenagers as there are today. And I'm really, you can see I'm getting passionate about yeah. this because I see it. I see it my own daughter, the problems that social media and all this stuff of recognition, attention is, is, is creating, not just teenagers, but all of us. Yeah. And, and I get so passionate. And my message, particularly to young people, is yes, we need it. I use social media. I use it all the time. But there's a time to put the damn things away. Yeah. And we used to say on adventures, um, leave nothing but footprints, take nothing but pictures. That was an adventure term. You'll be right. both familiar with that. Yeah. Right. I'm beginning to say now, leave nothing but, but footprints and leave the damn camera in your pack and maybe take yeah. it out once on the trip to take a picture and that's mm -hmm. it. So, I, do, um, do, you, do you think that... Um, sorry, Mills. Do you, do you think that um, authenticity... Because it seems that the people who have the most amount of push are people who are genuinely authentic with their reality. I'm going, listen, my life is, you know, I can get on here and fucking take really great pictures and show you mountains I'm climbing and cars I'm driving and boats I'm sailing and that. But life is not always like this. You know, life, life, you know I go home and I argue with my wife. I, I, I'm a, I, I travel, you know, a hundred days a year. I'm away from my children. I, I miss their first, his first kick of a soccer ball into a goal, you know, because I was working. Uh, do you think that, that that's where we need to head? Because, I mean, social media is definitely becoming a part of, of our reality, there's no, there's no turning back. We we can't undo it, but I, I agree when we're when we're going creating these falsified lives that are that make people feel as if their life is small. It seems though that the the people who are more authentic about the reality of of who they are seem to be influencing on a different level as opposed to just being false about, you know, pretending that everything is all plus, 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 when we know that I have two arms, two ears, two eyes, everything, everything is in duality. We have good and bad. Do you think that, that um, I suppose the question I'm asking is, do you think that we, ha we have to just be more authentic? Well, uh, the short answer is yes. The yeah. short answer is yes. Look, uh, I can think of, I mean, some people across the world who are authentic, uh, but, he, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, Mother Teresa, I'm thinking Dalai Lama, I'm thinking maybe Bill Gates, I'm thinking some other leaders, very difficult. But he, even the ones who do great works for mankind get sucked in because somebody will want to write about them and make them public figures. Right. And even they get a bit compromised. Right. But look, I think to go on social media, I think we are changing. And I'm hammering this and pretty much yeah. every public speech I do, every seminar, books are writing, hammer this whole thing about this social media epidemic yep. of sympathy or attention, recognition, uh, fame, and all the rest of it. I think, I think the, the tide will turn and people will start, will start catching people out, mm -hmm. saying, look, just attention seeking, look, look at me. And I think, I think we may get a bit of a recoil against it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the coming years. Mm -hmm. And I think authenticity could go on. Social, so, look, social attitude. The world's changed beyond all recognition in, in 25 years. Uh, you know, yeah. 25 years with the internet, 30 years of it now, social media with 15 years or so, it, it, it's becoming beyond recognition. Wokeness, I don't know about, you know, where you are, but it's the big topic of, oh, God, you know, social justice warriors. You know, right. how woke, it's the massive thing. But all the, I think the world is struggling to come to terms with this whole change of, of, of social media publicity, and we're, we're struggling, you know. Yeah you know, racial equality, gender equality, social yeah. equality, we're, we're struggling. Perhaps some things have gone too far, something. And I, I, I think the social media, I think we'll, we'll probably settle down, but it may take a few years to get yeah. to that settled state. Um, and I think authenticity will come through, will, yeah. will come through. I um, think um, people, I, I, I know I from, I, I think I know for myself that you can smell it from a mile away if someone's not being authentic for sure. But mm. I think what you're speaking to as well is a, a deeper sense that in within the individual that there's a 
that there's an innate um, uh, sort of temptation or an innate sort of uh, thing that happens within the individual to compare themselves with somebody who they see is, you know, has more or has different to them. So there, there's this innate um, – it, it just is, – it's another opportunity to um, – uh, add to low self worth when we're not um, yep. when we're not uh, educated on uh, on being able to overcome that mm. right and so mm. what I'm what I want to ask uh, you Adrian is how would you because I know you're big on goal setting and actually making practical goals what are some practical steps that you think that are we could we can do and we can teach our kids but we can do ourselves in terms of setting goals, in terms of not getting sucked into that comparison uh, place with, you know, with with seeing what we see over there and expecting or, or comparing ourselves to what we see online? Yeah, look, I, I ask this as a simple double-edged question. I ask people, you know, what, what's the goal? And then I say, why? Mm, right. Well, I want to, I want to climb the mountain. Why? Because I want to raise money for for a charity. That why, 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 mm. why, why? Strip it right down, yeah. and you'll 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 strip all those levels down, and then you get to your the authentic bit at the end. Most of it, most authenticity comes down at the end to some sort of legacy, right? And mm. uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's yeah. nothing wrong with wanting to make a mark on, on this earth. For, mm-hmm. for, you know. We're, we're only here for 80 odd years. Whatever you believe, what happens after that, that's personal beliefs one way or other. But mm. on, you know, on this form, in this body, it, you know, there's, there's one life. Unless you believe in reincarnation, yeah. of course. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to be sensitive to, to different views of anyone listening there. But so there's nothing wrong with legacy. But, but be authentic about what that, that legacy you, you want to do. Look, yeah. let me give you an example. When I was in, in 2015, I was climbing Makalu, the fifth highest mountain in the world. The Nepal earthquake Hit, hit, hit us. We were avalanched off, you know, all the rest of it survived. And look, and I thought, you know, we were stranded at this base camp, massive carnage all over Nepal. And I said, well, hold on a second. I, I'm, I'm medically trained. I'm a paramedic. I've got yeah. massive medical supplies. I'm acclimatized. I speak Nepalese. Um, I got expedition supplies. Why don't I just, I could do a good job here. And I'll, I'll and I, what I did was spent the next two months Trekking the road. There was a second earthquake two weeks later, and I went in there and was treating people. But the dilemma I had was do I just do this for myself or do I make it public? I went public after agonizing for, for a bit. Mm. What do I, mm. I went public because it got funding, got sponsorship in. But I can tell you what, after I did it, I was getting, you are a, I was getting message, you are a hero to our, to our country, that you know, you are a savior to them. I was getting this. You know, things coming through, and I was just getting, whoa, 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 is, is this right? You know, and, and it, it, I struggle with it. So I still go back. So I cut it off. I still go back to Nepal every year to do this medical mission, set up this medical mission. But it's a quiet thing. I'll keep it quiet. Now, I'm yeah. literally, I'm literally on, on, this, on sure. this podcast, but I'm doing it for a purpose. It's a point, yeah. It's no business to anyone else. I'm doing it because it's in my heart because Nepal, the Nepalese, yeah. the Sherpas, the Gurkhas are Amazing. part of my history mm. that's what I'm doing and it helps keep my language up it helps my medical skills mm. so, so can I just ask a question then at 12 years old you sit down and you start to write down what's important to you which you know I think is 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 great and I, I think all kids should be encouraged right from very young to start to contemplate what it is to set goals was there a part of you was you know, I, I knew when, when I was starting to do things when I was a kid, I, I wanted to be recognized. I, I wanted to be acknowledged by my dad. I wanted, you know, I wanted to feel like I, I, I you know, I was loved more, that I, that the work and time he'd put into me, that, that I was um, honoring that. Was there a part of you was doing that? Uh, is this, do you think, why you, you have this thing with significance, that there was a part of you went through something like that, that... I, I I mean I've heard you speak well, I've heard you speaking about the fact that you know you were a middle child and you'd kind of felt like that um, 
you, you know, your parents were busy and you wanted to be recognized. And you, I mean, you'd obviously found your, your niche very young. You loved adventure. You loved that sort of stuff. Was there part of you wanted to maybe your parents to see that you had found that and that that was important to you? It, it could well be right because there was some drive, you know, uh, struggling perhaps wasn't getting attention. Right. You know, little child looked unloved, unseen, unheard, yeah. and maybe I got it from these big, mm. the big wide expanses. There, there was a, I, I, there was a desire to, there was a desire to escape. There was yeah. certainly escape side. There was a desire to achieve everything I could in my life. I took that from my grandfather, who really did. He left school fourteen spoke seven languages wow. and really did everything around the world. My mother used to tell me, you know, I knew my grandfather very well, but I, I took a little bit from him. And um, was there a striving for, for you know, yes, significance, definitely, definitely significant. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually admitting it. It was about the significance. How much was it external? How much internal? That's a, that's a, the struggle. Look, when I joined Special Air Service, SS, yeah. the reserve unit, um, we weren't allowed to tell anybody. So to me, that was an authentic, I would want yeah. to achieve that for myself, to be the best I could be, yeah. um, as those tell But I, can I just expand the question? Because it was only when I went years later when I got into the development world and, and, I, and I did my values, let's go back to the very first question. I look back and think, well, what, what are my values? Number one, health and fitness. Health, fitness and sport. It drives me, everything I, I yeah. do, number one. Number two, achievement. Mm -hmm. Number three is nature. Number four is people. Number five is freedom. Those five are those are the five values that drive me. But when you look at one of them, achievement, which many people will have, achievement. What that means to you is that that's the deeper work. What does achievement mean? Is it is it is it the internal achievement, self worth, self respect, personal goals, or is it that external recognition, respect, fame? You've got to be honest with yourself about that and and work out what it is. And as I said to you earlier, even I've been compromising. K2, 2013, 2014, five mm -hmm. years ago. Was I still doing this for the personal side or was it for external recognition? I think I was compromised. Well, you had so, a you had a you know, big you had some big stuff going on personally before you undertook that, right? Yes, and thanks for basically that. No, it is, it's absolutely true because that was a pivot. A crisis involving my children, um, and that was a bit because the, the whole thing with K2 is one thing high risk, high reward. K2 was high risk, low reward. Most years, nobody got up, and in you, most years, you got a good chance of being killed for yeah. it. When a personal crisis hit me, which is, uh, I don't know whether I should say say it on the on the Feel air. Feel free or to not. if you're if you're it's comfortable a, if you're with it, our, our listeners would love to hear it. I, I'm comfortable because, I, and I think some people might resonate with it if I actually yeah. say what it was. Please, so, um, with very with respect for all those who might ever hear this, and it, it doesn't, you know, probably won't ever. But um, it was the ceasing of contact with my children mm -hmm. from my former wife. Um, which commenced a five-year battle mm. through family courts, uh, not for custody, for contact. Right. Mm. Now, if I can tell you, and uh, when I really take myself back, back in, you know, physical goals, bring them on. No problems at all. Mm. <laughs> mental goals, yep. And you spoke a little bit about, you know, mental goals, which on climbing these mountains. Emotional goals, where, where, where emotional challenges, that's not called goals. Physical challenges, mental challenges, emotional challenges. When you're when you're cut off from contact with your children, you know I went through the depths of despair, mm -hmm. and it was the pivot that decided me. Because when you're in the the real downsides, and I'm sure people mm -hmm. listening, whether it's losing their job, going bankrupt, being diagnosed with cancer, divorce, or what I went through, you know you can sink into depression. You can take the hard stuff the drink you can sink into even the harder stuff or if you've got the motivation you just bury yourself into some enormous enormous goal and that was my way to deal with this pain you know we, we will try and avoid pain as much as we can and that was the way to do it to do it that was what took me to k2 it basically stuff it now i've lost my kids okay i might get killed but whatever 
Mm. I've got to go to it because avoiding pain was the, was the big driver. Mm. It's funny though because would you say that you were avoiding one type of pain while in, like embracing a different type of pain? Yeah, I mean, you're going through pain climbing this mountain. Yeah. You're in agony. But, you know, you'll, you'll know it. The yeah. days you're climbing a mountain at altitude, it, it's the most exhausting, debilitating, challenging thing you can possibly do on Earth. Mm. The only good thing is when you get to base camp, you do have rest periods, whereas yeah. polar expeditions, it's day in, day out for two months. Yes, I was putting myself in pain. Maybe there's a masochistic tendency to, to do this, mm. to... Well, to be able take to take myself up, but I, you know, I, on my own, on those K two ex- expeditions, I, I wept at some stage. Mm. Um, mm. You, you have, <laughs> it's actually give, give me a put a vulnerable state, but you, you're so focused, and you've got to be. Um, I would allow myself to be taken out and just, and uh, but then oh, you get straight back, and mm. I did that whooshing sound with the blinkers on. You have to, because if you're climbing a mountain with distractions on kids or finances or partners or whatever, you take your eye off the ball, you could get killed by a rock falling down. So you, you've got to get into this compartmentalization. And my, and my, my partner, who's, um, who <laughs> we commute between Australia and, and, uh, mm. and, uh, and the UK, she actually uh, lives in Perth. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we, uh, you know, we, we, she's ex by we, we, no, no, each other many years, but but we um, she's noticed about me in the last few years how compartmentalised I've become. That's a that's an implication. Just just put it, you know, you just break one things down. You you can't sort of multitask the things. And the most the biggest challenges, the biggest crises. That's what you you've got to do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was <laughs> exhausting. I've been exhausted. That is a bloody Let therapy session. Up. Should I say it? Let- let me line it up. I'll tell you about my Viagra, taking Viagra to... Uh, oh, I heard. Mountain. I was listening <laughs> about that, that you took Viagra and you could talk about that. Uh, I am an... Uh, listeners, I am an addict to Viagra. Um, yes, I, uh, I I use it, to, the little blue pills, to, to summit these big mountains. Now, the real reason is because it was actually invented for other purposes than it's known. But um, but Viagra, the, uh, the other effects, it helps increase blood supplies to all your vital organs and may help prevent algae sickness, real serious algae sickness. Well, so that's I what I was missing. Blue pills to climb it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bit of yeah. Viagra. Um, I, 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 was, I was taking Diamox under... Um, di- oh. di- Diamox? No, oh. that right? Yeah. Diamox, yeah. Di- Diamox is very good for climbing mountains. It's yeah. not... Too good in the bedroom. It doesn't really affect <laughs> there. <laughs> Unless you're doing it at altitude. But um, yeah, we we um, were we, we were doing that, and I had some adverse effects to it. I I I got very sick on it. Um, but it didn't, I mean, it didn't stop us trying to attempt to, to get to the summit anyway. But um, I, I was just going to ask um, the the um, the the oh, my train of thought has gone there. We were just talking about. Um, oh yeah. So, how are the kids? That's a very again. Whenever people ask about this, you can you can either give the one minute version or yep. or the, the five hour version. Very difficult. Look, um, look. My daughter was the family court removed her to live with me. Um, right. So she has now lived with me mm-hmm. for nearly three years. Okay. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. I sure. won't mention my, okay. my, sure. my, my sure. son. I'll, I'll leave it at the daughter. Yeah. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and by the way, let me just tell you that just, but since she came to me nearly three years ago, that is, she is my fundamental top priority. She's got, she's what's called, she's got, she's quite a young, you know, she's teenage, but young. She's got some learning difficulties and I'm pushing as much effort into her development as I put into an expedition. And I'm talking things which, again, people with children will, will realize this. It's dancing lessons. It's singing lessons. Yeah. It's a theater club. It's just fantastic. It's the scouts. The scouts yeah. are incredible what they do. It's running clubs, getting out to nature. Yeah. Yes, she's on Snapchat. Yes, she's on social media. Mm-hmm. But she comes out into the big wide outdoors as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah. all these things are developing her as a person. Do you think, do you think then that, you know... Uh, the things that happen to us when we're younger and all the training and everything that goes on equips us to be able to handle these little souls that come into our lives, you know, and, and with learning difficulties and that sort of stuff. Do you think that in, in that 
you know, when you look back on everything that you've learned and what you've done, it was about equipping you to be able to handle this little child. Look, you know, you can look at that, ask that question two ways, you know, the, the everything happens for a reason type thing or the, the, the life has a way of working out how it should work out. I, you know, you, I've got my, my favorite one is, is things happen. Not everything happens for a reason. Things happen. It's up to us to find a reason. And sometimes uh-huh. that reason may take a day, yeah. a week, a month, a year. It may take five years yeah. to work out. Maybe take 10 years. You think, then you go back, you say, ah, that's what that was about. Right. So, um, it's a, but I, I think, I think also, you know, I think we're going very holistic here. Life has these, um, you know, things that present us, but you've got to have those antennas extended. Yeah. Those observation, mm-hmm. those awareness antennas. And this is probably coming to the world of the work you do. Uh, this awareness stuff, because I think p- things pass us by if we're not. And this is my problem again with, with social media. And the big example is people walking down the streets glued to their phone. They're not yeah. even looking around us. That's right. And another example is sat navs in cars. We're not looking around us. We've forgotten, we, you know, this, this sat nav telling us where to do. But I think it's a bigger, bigger picture in, in society, the way we are, that we're missing these, these things. And, the, and that's why, but, but yeah, I, I think. I think these challenges, it's the challenges we face. To go back to your question, you know, really do equip us. And it, it defines who we become. It's the yeah. challenges in life that define who we become, not our successes. So mm. You may disagree with some things, but it's no. the real challenges mm. that, that make us who we are. Mm. I'm far, you know, for this five-year court battle, um, and now I'm far more humble. Yeah. There's a humility. I don't think I was ever a, a bragger, but there's a, there's a whole ground inside to me now that perhaps wasn't so much maybe 10 years ago. Mm. Right. Um, I want to touch base on, I know there's so much that we could talk about just with your expeditions and stuff, but I know we've got to kind of wrap up fairly soon. And I just wanted to talk about a couple of things. And you mentioned that when you're going across the, 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 the straight, you know, not base camp because you're going up and down and you're, and you're resting. So um, polar expeditions. Yeah, the polar expeditions. And that you're saying that when you're thinking about that, end goal it's too much to think about that you have to break it down into little steps can you give us some because i know you talk about goal setting uh, a lot can you talk a little bit about that in terms of how practically we can like set goals in those increments we've just recently been working on that on for ourselves personally you know um but just to, to hear your thoughts on rather than looking just at the out to the end result I, I know that you've touched on the fact that you have to be authentic and you have to have the why that you're doing it one of the things we do is we really break down people's why 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 just like you've said but then from that how do you break that down like let's say somebody's why is the legacy or the, their why is to be connected or what have you Rather than having it as a big thing, how do you break it down into the small and into the measurable and into the achievable? So that yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very happy to answer that. Look, one of the things I, I think in the coaching world, a lot of them, you know, and I can put American accent, you know, some people say, "What's your five-year plan? Yeah. Where do you see yourself in ten years' time? Where do you see yourself ten years' time?" Now, look, you've got to have an idea where you want to of be, course. but I don't think today's world. I don't think today's world we can possibly know where we're going to be in in even three years, let alone five or two years. You know, it's gone of the days where you're born, I'm going to put a Yorkshire accent, you know, born in the village, married in the village, (laughs) worked in the village, and and, and died in the village. You know, that was your life mapped out. Mm. You know, we're we're so different. So I think we work year, year increments. A year is a very, very manageable cycle, and it goes pretty quick. So I work a year, you know, I, I know what I'm doing next year, but, but year cycle. And I, I usually set a theme for the year. It's a very, you know, I look at nature cycle, the earth orbits the sun a year. We, the energies of, of the new year energy, the September energy, the end of year reflection. Use that to your advantage. So theme for the year. That's what this year is about. I think it's a very, very a good thing that holds me to place what it is about. I've had some very really great ones the last few years. And then break it down to quarters. I think quarterly is a good thing. So, you know, don't, I want to run a marathon this year or something like that. Well, fine, but break it down to the 5K run, the 10K run, the half marathon. This is a simple yeah, example. Yeah. Um, in job searching, I'm sure many of your listeners will have been through this. Your goal is actually not to get a job. Your, your goal should be to get an interview. That should be the goal. You are trying to get into it. In fact, 
In fact, the best way of job searching is actually not to ask for a job, is actually to seek advice, ask for help. When people ask for help, and I get, I get job people, can, you, can I have a job in your esteemed organization? I get hundreds every week, and they're ignored. If someone takes the time to, to ask me for some advice, I'll always write back to them. Yeah. There's your goal. Ask for advice. And hopefully get an, uh, and the, the real goal was the interview. The, the end goal is, is, is getting a job. That's going to come out of those interim goals. So, you know, the two examples, just a, a race, physical, and, uh, and getting a job. And then in terms of um, working with teams and creating a team goal or a team vision, how do you, how would you, uh, would you recommend to do that in the same way? I mean, yeah, like, you've got to, look. Because, you know, when you're trekking and when you're, when you're, you know, on these mountains, you're not just on your own. You've got other people around you. So it's not just um, you trying to get there. It's like a team you've got to work with, you know. Yeah. Look, you ask most com- companies and most CEOs out there about what attributes they need in the workplace these days and teamwork comes right up the top, okay, mm-hmm. right at the top. And yet those same organizations, the only thing they'll do to create a great team is a once-a-year team-building day. Mm. And I'm talking about making a structure out of cardboard boxes and plastic or uh, <laughs> you know, a yeah, You've got to put the work in. You, yeah. Yeah, you've got to get, you've got to get what, do we t- what does this team stand for? Uh, and, uh, you know, look, I, I, you've got to get your agreements, your, your, your agreements in, in place. You've got to get the whole charter. You've got to... Everything has to be put in there. And um, look, I'm gonna. My, my main sport is rugby union. I love it. I think the All Blacks have have hmm. have always have had it. Uh, I'm gonna bring up a certain Australian rugby player, um, Israel Israel Palau. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, and you know his views. <laughs> now, some will say homophobic and you know a- absolutely outrageous views. I okay, you can agree that. Some people will say freedom of speech, his personal beliefs, and everything like that. Mm-hmm. These are two views of very extreme ends. My my thing is those are superfluous to what was the agreement in the team? What was the agreement to the Wallabies about speaking out on this matter, this matter, this matter? Did they have those team agreements or not? Because if they did have the agreements and he did, then he's broken it. And that's broken that trust of that right, team. Yeah. So I may, offend, I may offend some people um, by not putting on his 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 views, whether one side or another, but to me, what the team agrees or not is, is sacrosanct. And that goes for right. views on that, goes for drinking alcohol, goes night, yep. whatever it is, you know, you've right. got to get those greens in place. Right. Yeah. Listen, Adrian, it has been awesome talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Um, Thank you for being so transparent. Th- thanks for being so um, vulnerable and authentic. It was just, that was magic. That, that was, was cool. We, we can, deeply appreciate it. Can that. we finish off with just um, very briefly, if you could give us one and our listeners one piece of advice from your life and from your experiences, what would that be? Uh, I'm going to say that one I said a little bit earlier. You know, things happen or S-H-I-T happens, it's up to us to find the reason. And just delve deep into yourself, find the reason. It may take an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, five years or ten years. But usually you'll work out, yeah, that was the reason that happened. Yeah, no. You know, in our depths of challenges, depths of despairs, is the greatest learning. Oh, thank you so much, Adrian. Adrian, thanks we a million. appreciate it. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. If you found this information inspiring, make sure you subscribe and tune in to the next Dorothy and the Dealer podcast.